move right on to our next speaker now, uh, is Mark Gilchrist. He's a pharmacist from Imperial College Healthcare and the National Health Service in the UK. Uh, we've got to say good morning to Mark. He's a lot closer to his morning copy than we are. Um, he's a consultant pharmacist um, in infectious diseases and stewardship and leads uh, the Imperial College NHS Trust. Um, he's a council member of BSAC and co-leads the UK OPAD initiative. He has a particular interest in antimicrobial stewardship around improving systems and processes that affect local, national and international antimicrobial resistance. And we're really excited to hear Mark talk. Um, he always has lots of interesting things to say, so I'll hand it over to him. Hey, thanks, Ben. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I will try and do the necessaries and hopefully you can see that. Um, okay, so uh, I, I'm going to talk to you folks for the next uh, sort of 15, 20 minutes um, or so around the um, drug stability angle and drug treatments that we have within the OPAT, um, OPAT arena. Um, whenever I talk about this, I think a lot of people have uh, different opinions ar around um, drug stability. Some people think that we've been doing it for years and what's the big fuss about? Other people um, kind of think we don't really know about this and, and get a bit anxious. And then other people put a kind of research hat on and go, maybe we should be doing things um, a bit differently. So, as I say, I'm going to talk about stability in, in the context of burn and joint infections and is there a right answer to this and maybe put that in the context of patient safety um, and as other speakers have said and Ben and Ed and, and Kate have said that really this throws up quite a lot of questions. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to give you all the answers in 15-20 minutes or so um, and then a little bit about what we're going to try and do globally to solve some of these questions and like other speakers uh, this is really about thinking uh, not necessarily about Oviva at the moment um, and the longer acting um, uh, antimicrobials um, that, you, that we have, um, but asking is there a gap in the availability of the right drug we have for certain infections from an AMS perspective? So we've talked about tolerability and interactions and things like that, but actually when we look at the conditions we treat on OPAT, such as endocarditis, such as ESBL infections, the bronchiectasis patients that we have, and certainly the new challenges and new agents that we have around the MDR gram-negative bacteria, what are the drugs that we would like to use that maybe we can't use at the moment, and what are the drugs that we really don't have enough data for? So ultimately there is a there is a challenge around drug stability and there is a there is a lack of what we, what I've said for a number of years and what others have said which is validated and published data um, and that's really you know comes from lots of companies and, and, and other commercial institutions doing data and and I understand it from a commercial reason not wanting to share that but actually the drivers for stability testing ultimately come from a governance perspective a, a sort of an antimicrobial stewardship perspective broad versus narrow resistant organism service delivery options um, and that service development can talk about capacity, new and evolving patient populations and also uh, the convenience factors that we have. But I, I've talked about this before and when you look at the different drugs that you can use in APAT and you go globally, actually we're not yet there in terms of knowing a consensus model for um, giving these drugs, whether it's through uh, community nurses, whether it's through OPAC clinics, uh, or whether it's through, um, you know, self-administration. Um, and when we looked at this in the United Kingdom, anyway, um, when we were looking at it to our kind of strict guidance, we found that there were no published studies that satisfied the UK criteria. Um, and we can talk about that maybe a, a little bit later on in terms of the validity of that, but there is still this question around stability and and if you think about it in the burn and joint field, what is the right answer? Is there a right answer to this? So we have testing protocols where people will look at you know pH of the drug, they'll look at how much the product concentration degradates, um, and as Kate mentioned around you know the container, is it is it um, sort of leachable in a way, in a way? Does the drug leach out from it? Um, then you also have testing criteria, which looks at sort of high and low concentrations. Can you duplicate, triplicate 
the, the, the data that you're seeing at specific time points. And then the temperature comes into that, the loss of an, of an actual um, active ingredient and looking for the degradation products, which I don't think we've spent time doing, but is that a big factor in some of the, cons some of the drugs that we're using in OPAT and have we seen that? And then we come on to the standards and the standards around what are the actual, what do we class a product to be safe? Um, what do we feel that there should be enough drug in the, in the compound at the end of therapy? And the real sticking point to make this in a global collaboration effort is that each country has different standards. And I think now in 2020, we're at a time where we can come together and maybe think about having one standard that we can utilize across countries, across nations, because ultimately we have the same goal in what we're trying to do. And certainly in the UK, where we are uh, sort of restricted in a way to the, this yellow cover document, which is now starting to enreach into other countries and, and make people think. And there is a need to, to ensure that there is a compliance around the medicines that we administer. Um, and a slight I guess, dilemma in the fact that manufacturer data may not be sufficient um, because it may not have been tested for that. And that published data may be of limited value depending on the quality and methodology that's been used in that setting. So, you know, ultimately, I think this is around patient safety. This is around making sure that we have the evidence to make sure that we have PKPD targets that are met, but also knowing that the products that could potentially lead to toxicity. And that as I said, probably answers more, opens more questions than answers um, into what is the optimum temperature for these devices? What are, are we limiting our options unnecessarily? So are we restricting what we give to patients because of some data, but not a full, full set of it? Um, and also around the losses um, and, and gains of, of drugs in, in infusers. And we need to build up that global practice. So I'm going to, it's quite difficult to talk in 15 minutes of all the drugs that you can use for bone and joint infection. So what I've done is try to look at some of the literature around maybe some of the more common agents that we use in the um, OPAT bone and joint field um, and give you a flavour of maybe that there isn't consensus out there and, and that's what we need to we need to look at. So the first of those um, looks at amoxicillin. This is a French study that was published last year. Um, and interestingly, this was one of the first studies that actually talked about degradation products of amoxicillin if you, have, if you don't have the, the optimized conditions when you are using them in a, in a flow, um, flow device. So they talk about having optimized conditions at 25 mg per litre, uh, per mil, sorry, storing it at 12 hours. So a BD regime at room temperature that can be used on an OPAT, um, an OPAT program. But as you see, as the concentration goes up, the stability tends to wave off and it goes quite quickly, meaning that actually it may not be suitable for um, a, an OPAT environment, let alone an inpatient environment. Um, and I know, I know there are centers and us included, which we use amoxicillin in an infuser in intensive care, um, but understanding the, repl the replicability and the um, and, and the impact, clinical impact of this is important, particularly when you've got patients who are out in the community. That extends to benzyl penicillin. So we know benzyl penicillin is relatively stable. Um, this is a Japanese study that was done a number of years ago. And again, we don't have um, sort of current evidence in terms of, um, or more recent evidence in terms of these studies that have been done. We're going back a number of years to find the data. So if anyone out there is doing stability studies, we'd love to sort of get in touch with you. Um, but they again found that 95% um, at 25 degrees, 90% at 31 degrees was, um, was uh, adequate and it was stable when it was kept in the fridge. And then this is where we have a, a, a sort of a difference of opinion. So the, the initial data was showing that ampicillin was unstable and Kate may alluded to that and actually you know the, the great idea around doing therapeutic drug monitoring in the setting um, and, and dose altering as you find it may be a very good way of of thinking about how you administer continuous infusions but there is a debate about whether or not we should be using am, um, ampicillin um, and maybe that will feed out in the in the discussions I'm not saying what's right or wrong I'm just saying that the literature is not there in terms of a a, a, a concise statement. Some of the work we've done um, in the UK to try and establish this is through the BSAC Drug Stability Programme um, 
as part of the OPAT initiative. And we've managed to put a number of drugs through which have now been published, one of which is uh, flucloxacillin. And some of you may have seen this data um, already, but, it, but in effect, it's flucloxacillin in a, a 10 milligram and 50 milligram per mil infusers tested in triplicate, stored at seven days in the fridge and also at 14 days. And what you find is that even if you use the, the Australian, the UK, the American models of, of standards, it pretty much hits the um, percentage of drug retaining in the device at the end of 14, um, 14 days. We've just um, just been accepted for publication is the the Piptazo data, which is um, which will be coming out very shortly. And again, you see that over ninety five percent of the drug is retained in a Piptazo pump, whether that's the piperacillin or the Tazobactam arms of those at two concentrations. And so, and so that that was something that we wanted to do to hit the sort of gram negative agenda as well as the pseudomonal aspect because the the lack of pseudomonal. Um, agents we have, particularly in, in bronchiectatic, but also in our bone and joint infections, um, when Cipro is not um, not an option. The the carbapenems are, 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 are trickier, and and we we'll, I'll show you some data where why this is um, this is an interesting topic. We know it's an unstable drug, and we know when you reconstitute it, it doesn't sort of act as we as we would like it to. It has a very limited sort of shelf life. And when we looked at that in terms of degradation of the drug um, through the program, we did find that after about six hours or so, it goes off the sort of 90, 95% um, of drug retaining. But actually, is that an issue? Is that a problem? And I know in, in Australasia, that the, the drug is used in, in higher doses to, to overcome that. Um, but again, it poses a question, which is an old question around, is that is that the right thing to do? And again, I, this is data from Australia, which has looked at the stability of meropenem um, that came out very recently, looking at different concentrations and looking at the optimal concentrations of meropenem. And I'm really interested if any of the authors of this are on the call tonight to, to, maybe, to maybe talk about this a little bit more. But it brings into the context of lowering, lowering the, um, the temperature of, of drugs and potentially freezing drugs. And what does that do to, to the stability of these agents? And so this is a very topical, um, discussion point. Um, our other pseudomonal drugs that we use in, in bone and joints, uh, keftazidine has, has attracted a lot of global interest mainly because of the of the decrease in shelf life that, w that came around from a lot of the manufacturing units globally around this. So again we've we've looked at this and, and, and found that um, particularly at um, day three, you see this drop off at even the lower end of the European and Australasian um, limiting data of 90%. So it sort of goes off at almost three days. Um, and what you find is that pyridine generation, which is the degradation product that people worry about, whether or not it's clinically significant is a different um, kettle of fish. Um, but you find that actually it, it sort of creeps up at day three to the cutoff marks at 15 milligrams in a device of 12 mg per mil. And it, and it just reaches over the 30 milligram per device in a 25 milligram per mil at three days, um, three days. And again, that's being submitted for publication. But what it means is that should we lower the dose of keftazidine? Not sure. Should we dilute the dose of keftazidine in a larger volume? But actually, is that practical for OPAT? Do we lower the temperature of solution and does that have an adverse effect or on the flow rate? We're not entirely sure. And really Australia has been leading the way in this in terms of temperature um, at room standards and warmer climates and devices. And there's a number of studies and one of which has just recently come out in the European Journal of Hospital Pharmacy looking at um, looking at exactly the warmer climate issue. But, it, but really coming up with the fact that actually several drugs don't meet the OPAC criteria and that we need more evidence and, and more data around that. Um, the Swiss, so, um, so this is thanks to um, Dr. De Valier in, in Lausanne in Switzerland, who we've been working with, looking at the degradation products of, um, of antibiotics. And so if you lower the constant, you lower the temperatures to 10 and 15, Celsius, you see that you can sometimes get these drugs over the line in terms of um, a, a more stable drug, and particularly around the imipenem silastan um, and the meropenem, so carbapenems, certainly. 
Um, but the Swiss and others have looked at the clinical outcomes and drug degradation, looking at four drugs of Vank, Clinda, uh, Amox and Meripenem and found relative success, although the stability of those drugs were always questioned in terms of drug degradation. So what the Swiss um, took, took forward further is they looked at Fluclox, Kefepine, Vank and Piptazo um, to look at the um, epidemiological cutoff values for uh, these drugs. Um, to see whether or not they had an effect on unplanned admission, relapse, and clinical efficacy. Um, and you can see the reference there, and I would sort of recommend you to go and, go and read those um, if you can. Um, but what, what they have now done, which is similar to, I think, what you were saying, Kate, is, is the, the plasma drug levels that you see on the screen there. They measure plasma drug levels for a number of agents. Um, and have maximum doses that they can put in their drug in their pumps with buffers um, and relative stability data um, there as well. So there is emerging data coming out, particularly in Europe, um, around around that. And then the final drug, just to sort of uh, really think about the, um, the 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 gram negative agenda when we talk about bone and joint is the keftolazine tazobactam, which which again has been looked at by a number of countries and a number of publications on that. Um, and when we've looked at that um, uh, in-house, we found that again, from a European perspective, it probably just falls short of the 95% range. But actually, if you take the 90% cutoffs, it seems to be a very good drug that can be used in a in a in a device or, or infuser, both from a keftolazine perspective. And we know that the tazobactam was good from the piptazo um, piptazo studies. So. It again goes back to this question around um, the evidence of stability, um, making sure that we have the appropriate PKPD parameters to look at and this knowledge of sort of degradating drugs in a way. What is that optimum temperature that we're looking at? What is the, um, are we limiting the, the options that we have maybe unnecessarily because of myths, because of um, people's practice because of well, whether that's good or whether that's bad and the, whether or not the losses that we're seeing are they clinically significant or not and that's why we have to try and build up a wider global community to 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 talk about those and so I just want to sort of finish for the last couple of minutes think, thinking about um, OPAT in, in terms of what we're trying to do globally and reaching out to our Australian friends as well in that for the next three years, the BSEC strategy is looking at proactively identifying agents and investigating agents that will help the literature and help OPAT services globally in looking at stability data and shelf life data. And we will be launching very shortly a new international collaborative, which is looking at the drug stability testing with the Swiss um, and also um, with the University of Queensland bringing three institutions together. And if anyone else would like to globally partner and come on board, we'd be really help, uh, really glad to, to talk to you about that. But really the, the premise of this is to have all of the drug stability data in one place, look at resources, create a forum for discussion, um, and also have the ability to run surveys and, and, and other analyses through that. And that will be launched um, relatively, uh, relatively soon. But the goal is really to try and develop this drug stability data, as I said, to make sure that we have specialist um, testing centers. And we don't want to make that in one country. We'd like to make that elsewhere um, and also be specific to disease pathology. So in the, in the bone and joint infection field, what drugs actually work um, in the stewardship dilemma of orals versus IVs and try and come up with a priority list of drugs and compounds that we can submit and put through the program. And really that means then that we have some novel testing protocols and we have some cost effective models that we can use within patient groups and a, really a forum for debating the requirement for global standardization. And as, as I've said, why should the recommendations be different in Australia than the UK to the US to Switzerland to Australasia? Um, so I think we need to stop that and, and uh, enhance that discussion particularly with industry um, regulatory bodies um, um, and others. So the first output of that is going to be an international survey, which um, 
which will talk about drug stability, which drugs do we really want to know about, which drugs do we want to prioritize, and, and not necessarily just within the antibacterial field, the antifungal um, and the antiviral field. So acyclovir has been mentioned a lot of the time to, to discuss, um, discuss that. Um, and there's, then there's lots of uh, very clever people um, who, uh, who help on that, on that journey and contribute from the UK side. Um, and thank you to the initial start of international collaborators. So thanks very much.